I'd like to welcome JJ Eastwood, Managing Director of Carousel Media Group. Hello, JJ. Hello. Thanks for having me this morning. It's good to see you again, virtually. <laughs> yes. Right. So, uh, okay. I'll give you the floor now. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. So today I'm here to discuss with you the rise of retail media. If anyone has been paying any attention to LinkedIn or the global press, the global advertising trade press, you'll see that almost every day there's a new article about retail media. But I think what has been lacking in that press has been an understanding of what's going on here in Asia. So today, that's kind of my main objective is to share some insights of a recent IAB research piece that we put together. I'll also break down exactly what retail media is, the different types of re retail media networks, um, and kind of what's next. We'll sort of talk about some of the challenges and, and the opportunities. So first of all, to just touch on why is retail media such a phenomenon right now today? And I think to answer that question, you almost got to take a step back to Q1 of last year, where for the very first time ever, Amazon came out and released their advertising numbers. And while most people were guessing what those numbers were, I think the whole world was in shock when they realized there's a $40 billion ad business at Amazon that up until Q1 last year was on their P&L, just a line item saying other. Um, it just it was a bit of a coincidence, but at the same time, Walmart released their advertising numbers again for the first time ever. And people were quite shocked because they only started their ad business five years ago and already their ad business at $2 billion. So that kind of gave birth to this, what we would call the rise of, of retail media. Um, I touched on the agenda, but after those numbers came out, eMarketer, um, as you can see, this is a report they put together. They did this report to try and understand where is retail media today globally and where is it going in the future? And they were quite surprised at how fast it had grown and how fast it is likely continue to grow into the future. And they build it as the third big wave in digital advertising. Obviously we started in the early 2000s with search. Then, you know, we had the heyday of social media and they believe that for the next 10, 20 years, retail media is probably going to be one of the, the most prominent media sectors. So if we get into some of the forecasts, this is a global forecast put together by WPP. You're saying that today already there's a hundred billion dollars in retail media. And this was almost impossible to forecast 12 months ago prior to Walmart and Amazon releasing their numbers. And um, so what happened is, is whenever Walmart and Amazon released their numbers, it, it kind of gave WPP a framework to estimate where this could go. So they, they calculated it off the total sales. Um, and what percentage of the advertising is total sales. So you can say like the high watermark is Amazon, where 5% of, they call it GMV, gross merchandise value, which is uh, essentially sales, is their ad business. So what they looked at was all the different types of media, retail media networks. And they said, okay, if Amazon's 5%, if even if these retail media networks can get to 3%, this is gonna be 160 billion. Um, and this is excluding China. So kind of the question is, okay, well, what, what are the key drivers behind this? Like what's at the crux of it? Obviously it's the first party data is crucial um, in it, being able to really serve people advertisings, advertisements in the moment and with the exact product or SKUs that they're searching for or something that is as relevant as possible to that product that they're searching for. Another really big piece is the closed loop up attribution, being able to know every ad that I serve, that you can track it right back to the sale. And you've got a really clear understanding of your return on ad spend. Obviously that makes these ads more relevant. Another piece, which is interesting, I'll get to the slide in a moment about the different types of retail media networks, but scale is going to be quite important. And what eMarketer have mentioned is that in order for a retail media network 
to actually be prominent in the industry, they're going to need at least tens of millions of monthly active users. The interesting piece is actually full funnel campaigns. I get to that at the end, and that's really sort of talking about the future of retail media and, and where it's going next. But just another thing to kind of touch on is that retail media seems to be filling these gaps of these like three mega trends that are happening at the, happening at the moment. Um, so you've got the decline of traditional TV, you've got the loss of third party identifiers. We've already lost them on iOS and Firefox. We don't have any third party identifiers in the likes of connected TV and digital audio. And then as we know, cookies are going away supposedly next year. And then the third kind of trend where, which retail media sort of plays a part in is the digitalization of stores. And so you can see you've got all these mega trends coming together and it's kind of really the rocket fuel, if you like, for retail media today and, and, and into the future. So let me just touch on this report. Um, it's a report that we worked with the IAB for Southeast Asia. The report went out to 2,000 senior leaders in the industry, both marketers and agencies. And it was really trying to understand the trends in the industry. So some of the key findings, one of the things that was quite interesting is that almost 60% already had retail media as part of their plans. Still a big opportunity, almost 40% saying that they ha don't have it as part of their plan today. And then we, we asked, what proportion of your spend is on retail media? And as you can see, a large number of people are really only dipping their toe in the water. 56% have less than 5% of their budgets in retail media at the moment. So again, another big opportunity. And this was kind of the shocking slide. Almost everybody that was surveyed came back and said that they intend to spend more in retail media in the future, which is super encouraging. This was an interesting question. So we tried to understand, okay, if everybody's going to spend more retail, on retail media, where is the money coming from? And this is a question that eMarketer asked in their, their study in North America, and their results were completely opposite of what we have here. So if you look at this gray bar where you can see only 6% of the retail media budgets are going to come from traditional marketing. In the US, the vast majority of the budgets are actually coming from that traditional marketing bucket. Whereas you can see in Asia, the vast majority of the budgets are coming from the in-store shopper marketing trade budgets. So this is a very different trend, a very different dynamic between Asia and, and North America. So the last piece of the survey, which I wanted to call out today, and just uh, if anyone's interested in the full survey, it's available to download at the IAB SEA's website. And um, this is one that was super interesting as well. So it makes sense that brands who have products bought and sold on a marketplace or on a retail media platform, they're going to invest more in the future. But this stat was quite interesting for us because what it's saying here is that almost half, 44%, said that they were going to invest more in retail media even if they didn't have a product bought and sold on that platform. So we call them non-endemic brands. Give you an example of what non-endemic brands would be brands like insurance companies and uh, banks and uh, fast food companies. They, these guys understand that they're tapping into shoppers. Shoppers need credit cards. Shoppers get hungry like everybody else, perhaps even more so. So this is quite an interesting finding as well. Okay, so next I want to break down the different types of retail media networks. And, and in my mind, they kind of break into three types of categories. So you've got the digital marketplaces. Everyone's familiar with the likes of Carousel. Or, or we've got three main marketplaces across the region, Carousel, Chotot in Vietnam, Muda in Malaysia. And we've brought them all together on the one ad platform to create Carousel Media Group. You have Amazon ads, Shopee ads, Lazada ads. The next kind of, uh, the next kind of example would be mass merchant retailers. The atypical example of this is Walmart in the US, but you've got some local players who are starting to build out a media component as well, like Fairprice in Singapore. 
And there's quite a few other examples. Maybe if you look back to, to Australia, you've got Woolworths. There's some interesting things going on in France and in Europe as well. And the third classification, if you like, is the intermediaries. So we've got Grab ads and Food Panda ads, and they're obviously work really well for um, the likes of FMCGs and Coca-Cola, etc. So there are three types of media um, networks. But I think what's important to call out is that at the core of every retail media network, and if you look at that 100 billion that I mentioned before, around 90 billion of it comes from these types of ads. So Amazon call them sponsored search ads. We call ours car sale shopping ads, but essentially they work in relatively the same way. In the, at the top of the screen here, you can see an example from Amazon. Someone is searching for a food blender. They're gonna get a real mix between organic search results and sponsored product ads. But the, the important piece of this is those sponsored product ads are gonna be as relevant as the organic search ads. If you look just below, this is an example of our carousel shopping ads. If someone's searching for Nike Dunk Glow, you can see that you've got regular consumer, the regular listings, and then we've got that ad there um, pulling in that exact skew that people are searching for. This is what's at the core of every retail media network, and this is what's driving the growth. This is what's delivering the results, and this is why more and more marketers are going to invest in this channel in the years to come. Okay, so let's touch on what's next for retail media. And there's lots of hypotheses out there. There's talks of consolidation. How do we, how, so it's not so much an issue in Asia, but if you look at the chart of the amount of different retailers who now have some kind of adver advertising proposition in the likes of North America and Europe, you're talking 30 or 40 different sort of platforms for marketers to plug into, which seems too, way too many. So there are a number of vendors out there who are looking to be able to consolidate this. Um, I've spoke to some supply side platforms that are looking to be able to consolidate this. And I also spoke to some DSPs who are looking to plug into all of them so you can run campaigns across all of them. Nothing's really, it's all very, very early days. And I don't think this is really going to play out for another couple of years to come. But I think what is more prevalent what is going to happen a lot more in the, in the next sort of six to 12 months, particularly in Asia, are these data collaborations. And really what that means is, is that, we, that the retailer and a brand can come together and enrich each other's data about what they know about a certain consumer. So let me give you just a, an example of that. You know, with Carousel, we're talking to an, a bunch of different brands. One is an airline. So the airline might know that a consumer has bought flights to go to Japan, and we're able to tell them that that consumer has just recently bought a new snowboard. They've bought some salad pets. You know, okay, we can quickly assume that, that we know why they're going to Japan. That's just one example of the kind of data collaborations. Now, there's a few key pieces that need to be put together for this. You've heard a lot of talk about um, data clean rooms. Um, and that's really what this is. You've got some independent third party who's going to act as the, the, the facilitator for these data collaborations where in a privacy compliant way, you, know, you can enrich each other's data without actually you know, disclosing who that user is on, on either side. So this is certainly something to watch out as a trend in retail media. And the last one is retail media moving up the funnel into the more the more high impact, the branding type solution. So everyone knows that we're super good at targeting that consumer of the right product in the moment. But how do we take those insights about what people are buying and then use that to connect with them, perhaps when they're in a more relaxed environment in a connected TV, digital audio and the likes. There's a lot of retailers who are already working on this. We have partnered with the Trade Desk to facilitate this. Amazon have built their own DSP, and there's a lot of players who are working with Google for both display and video. So that is a very short and sweet overview on retail media that I could probably talk to about for hours on end. But I think that the key points were all put together in this presentation, and I'm more than happy to take any questions that anyone might have. 
All right. Thank you so much, JJ. We're not done yet. And yes, you good to know that you're ready for the questions. I have some for you. <laughs> you ready? Yes. All right. So what I understand here, right, is that the Carousel Media Group ha has presence in seven markets, right? And based on your observation, so which market is more adoptive in the use of retail media for marketing campaigns? And why do you think they are more open to collaborate with, with uh, retail media? We actually have campaigns and, uh, and advertisers. If you, I'll take a step back. If you think about the brands that are most relevant for re a retail media offering, we would call mm -hmm. them endemic brands. So they are brands that are that have products that are bought and sold on our platform, or they have products that are very similar to the products that are bought and sold on our on our platform, and they tend to be brands that have a regional presence. Um, so what we're seeing is that those brands who operate in every market um, have the same level of sophistication in, in every market. So it's funny you ask that we had a, a weekly our weekly meeting only an hour before this presentation. <clears throat> and we were looking at we we're looking at the kind of the, or we launched this shopping ad product only about three months ago. Um, mm -hmm. And we're looking at all of the new brands who are coming on board and every market is just as advanced as either. So there's no real difference. It's it's more about the brands rather than the, the markets. Right. Okay. So since you mentioned about the brands, right? Earlier you mentioned about this, you have listed on it or identified these brands who are coming on board uh, with you at uh, Carousel Media Group. So what type of industries do you usually work with and why these industries are working with you? Yeah, it's a good question. So the, the big industries for, for retail media for, for us, now it'll be, it will, will be different for other platforms, if you like. So mm -hmm. for us, our big categories are electronics. So we're working with a lot of electronic brands, phones, laptops, all, every type of electronics device are bought and sold on our platform. Even the likes of high-end headphones, high-end, you know, hair dryers, high-end. Most people will come to Carousel, Chiotot and Muda to look for those household brands at a good value. So mm -hmm. in an ideal world, they're going to get it, a brand new item that's discounted um, or a pre-loved item that's going to have some kind of warranty with it or some kind of the certification. So electronics is really big for us. The other one, which is quite broad, we call retail, and that includes fashion, that includes furniture, and that includes the, the more mass retailers who will sell a lot of wide range of products from bikes to tents to sporting goods, et cetera. Uh, they were our two biggest. And then autos is really big for us as well. But if I put my hat on to talk about more broadly, mm -hmm. FMCG is a huge category. We work with some brands in FMCG, but you know, really we don't have a lot of consumers coming to our platform to buy shampoo or toothpaste or the likes. But all in all, that is a, a huge category. And then particularly for the likes of Coca-Cola, who might work with Food Panda and Grab and those types of uh, platforms as well. Right. Okay, great. So since we just, uh, I just asked you about the brands, the usual brands who are uh, working with you currently and what they can do with you. Now let's go again with the most important part of this discussion, which is the consumer, right? So the preferences of typical consumers, particularly in their consuming um, habits, right? They have definitely changed, especially during, you know, modern times and, you know, the pandemic affected um, as well. So in line with this, how do you think retail media networks can meet the expectations of today's consumers? Well, the beauty about retail media networks is any successful campaign, whether that's working with endemic brands or non-endemic brands, generally taps into what consumers are searching for in that moment. So it makes complete sense. If I'm searching for some sort of phone, I'm going to pull in a product ad that is directly related to that. So that's meeting the consumer's need. And that's relatively straightforward on how you understand. Now, if we go back to the research, almost 50% of people who were, were surveyed said that they were going to invest more in retail media, even if they didn't have a brand or product that was bought and sold on that site. So what we're mm -hmm. saying, talking about there is these non-endemic brands, you know, the insurance companies and the banks, et cetera. Now, I think what's really important for those brands who are considering this is to put the hat on of of the, the product marketer to say, okay, 
I might be selling an insurance product or a finance product, but how do I start, tap into what consumers are searching for on that platform? How do I make my banking or insurance or fast food product relevant to that platform? And it's a different paradigm shift. You can't just run the same banners that you're running in the open internet. That's not really going to be effective. And it's kind of a wasted opportunity. So let me give you a couple of examples of some brands who've done this really well. We have lots of passionate communities on our platform. In Singapore, one of the biggest is what we call sneaker freaks. <laughs> and so there's about half a million in Singapore, They but they trade high-end sneakers um, quite often for multiple times what the, the sneakers original purchase price was. And um, so the brand came to us, insurance company, and said, okay, how can we tap into one of these passionate communities? Um, and ultimately, as any insurance company, they're looking for leads. So we said, okay, look, our biggest that we can identify um, is this, this sneaker freaks. And why don't we run a competition and we'll give away like a, a, a really high end limited edition Air Jordans. Um, so they did that. And was, what was quite interesting was it wasn't the traditional prize giveaway. It actually had an offline component to it too. So you could enter a prize draw, but in order to win, you had to go to this offline event. Um, and they were blown away by, by how successful that was. They had way more leads than any other campaign they'd run um, that year. It, super successful, tapping into what people are looking for. I'll give you another mm -hmm. one quick example. Again, it's another insurance company. Um, again, they're thinking differently. It's like they came to us and said, how can we tap into to your users in a meaningful way? So this was September last year, and we said, okay, why don't we look at the top three searched items on on Carousel um, that month, and we can use those items as a giveaway. We know the vast majority of our users are searching for them, and they want those items. So back mm -hmm. then, those items were the Brompton bikes. I'm not sure you're familiar with those folding bikes. Um, it was an iPhone 13 and a Nintendo Wii. Again, we put those three items, which the vast majority of consumers on our platform were searching for at that time. And um, mm -hmm. again, super successful campaign. So that's just a thing for brands to think a little bit differently um, if they're a non-endemic brand to a retail media network. Wow, that's great to learn. I'd like to move on to the next one, um, JJ, right? So uh, let's talk about artificial intelligence, you know, chat, GBD and other AI tools, right? So how brands using emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning to optimize their retail media strategies, right? And what are the benefits and challenges associated with this approach? Yeah. And so, you know, I think artificial intelligence is, it's a word that's kind of bantered around a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a data scientist, but I think our data scientist team, uh, are a lot smarter than me say like, like JJ, JJ, that's not get into this AI realm and pretend we're doing, you know, these, you know, deep neural networks or anything like that. W mm -hmm. Really what we do is we build um, ML models. So I can only really talk to what, about what we're doing. So what we've done is in order for us to serve consumers relevant products for what they're searching for, organic search, we need to build ML models. And the most simplistic way to think about how that works is that when a, a product is created, a, when a, a listing is created, so if you wanted to sell your phone on, on Carousel, for example, you put in all of the details, um, you put in your headline, you put in the price, et cetera, et cetera. And the ML models that we've built will then assign a certain number of keywords to your listing. It's around 50 um, keywords. So what we've done is we've taken those ML models. We had to tweak them slightly, and there's a few different parameters that would need to be put into them, and we use them for the shopping ads. So it's a very similar. The client gives us a feed, an API or CSV file. Every product SKU that, that, that's given, the, the models will build around 50 keywords that are, are related to that specific product, and then. The other component is the bidding kind of situation, how much people are paying on a cost per click, which is different from organic search. So that's a, a, a lightweight version of AI that's obviously going to get much more sophisticated over time. Um, and But it's not a, exactly a, a deep learning neural network chat GPT type. Right. Okay. Thanks for that, uh, JJ. I want to ask this one last question to you. <laughs> Okay, 
what's your top most advice okay for brands for companies looking into collaborating with a retail media like carousel media group yeah i think it's just to reiterate the point that i mentioned before it's uh, to go in this with an open mind and and realize that it's not your traditional media play um i think the worst mistake that brands could make would be taking traditional open internet type banners and just trying to plug them into a retail media network uh, that's really not going to work i would speak to the sales team and say hey listen how can this campaign be successful i'm willing to create new assets for your platform and they'll get much much better results great great thank you so much i uh, thank you so much jj over the pandemic we have seen how retail right was pushed forth into unprecedented innovation making the most out of digital technology. So as we move forward and enter in the next wave, okay, in the market, retail media is presenting a multitude of opportunities that are just awaiting to be activated, which which JJ has mentioned earlier during his sub presentation. So thank you so much, JJ, again, for a great presentation and sharing. Thanks for having me.